<laughs> so as a way of celebrating being just about a third of the way done with this project, I have decided to read the top 10 of my written blog entries on the video camera. Day 30, letting go of beautiful mirrors. Something I read yesterday prompted a thought about mirrors. No, not the tangible kind that hang over the bathroom sink. Although that reflection can be powerful, I'm referring to the reflection of ourselves we see in people that surround us. When I was a little girl, barely a teenager, my mom gave me a gem, a piece of information that was to help guide self-reflection for years to come. She told me that when she was little, her grandma said to her that if you find something annoying or bothersome about someone else, it's best to take a look at yourself, that the actions of others that bother us do so because we ourselves may exhibit those same behaviors. Of course, it took a long time before I came to understand this on a deeper level. Level, but the underlying message was received. In my later years, as I began studying the human psyche and spirituality, I surely came across this same message, but the concept was commonly referred to as using each other as mirrors. For many years, I've used this brilliant form of reflection to peek inside myself and witness the subconscious beliefs and opinions at work. By observing my intolerances for others' behaviors or actions, I've gained much insight about my own faults and patterns. Thanks, Mom, for passing down that message of wisdom so early in my life. So you must understand my excitement when yesterday I came across a new perspective, similar yet so much more scrumptious. Written by Dr. Korch at advancedpersonaltherapy.com, we are always attracted to an outer man or woman who somehow embodies not yet lived out or realized and therefore projected aspects of our own anima or animus. We actually fall in love with ourselves via the projection, i.e. with bits of ourselves we have not yet seen, and so we feel we need the other person because they are able to express what we cannot. At the moment of reading this, my perspective burst open. I felt the rigidity of structured thought explode out of its confining boundaries and flood with new understanding. All of a sudden, I could see all the positive qualities that I was in deep admiration of in many of my exes, and noticed that I lacked those qualities within myself, making the person extra refreshing to be around. My second thought was a shock. I realized I've been only focusing my attention on the reflection that leads to recognition of the qualities I did not like in others and myself. I think it'd be good right now to mention that there are many other ways of interpreting the reflections we see in others, but both of these specific interpretations focus on self-growth through self-change. One perspective we're looking at observes the unattractive qualities I do not prefer, but which I possess and want to give up. The other perspective we're looking at observes the qualities I love, but which I may lack and want to cultivate more of, so as to be whole and not seek exterior completion of self. From Deepak Chopra's The Path to Love, Spiritual Strategies for Healing, the normal state of life, as normal as defined by our culture, is not to be in unity. Even so, it is natural for you to seek to be whole again, to heal separation by fusing yourself with another person. This underlying drive makes relationship extremely powerful. We seek in another what we lack in ourselves so as to feel complete. But when we are already consciously whole and present, we do not need another to feel completed. So this offers an affirmative to the question I posed on day 22. When they leave us, it will not take away from who we are, as we are already whole. Again from Deepak Chopra's The Path to Love, this pain grows out of the state of separation. It is not created by what another person does to us. It is a state of unity. The self would provide unconditional love, which means that no betrayal or abandonment could harm us. When you are in union, no one can really leave you. There are still many ways in which my ex and I are similar, but I must recognize and also honor the things about him that I would prefer to be different in the partner that I'm committed to. I want to be able to bow to the ways in which he is and the ways in which he's not. If I was in the midst of a conscious, growing, committed relationship, I'd be happy to work with those differences, accept all that he is, and grow together in a positive way. Instead, I find myself in the middle of a celibacy project, one that at its very core is asking me to step away from romantic relationship. With my ex lingering in my thoughts and my heart, I hate to admit that it's been a crutch. Letting go is hard to do, but now that I'm wiggling the wobbly leg of that crutch, in the moments between vibrations, when I find my heart and mind free of romantic love for another, I feel the space and aloneness of true singleness. That is how I know that I'm more consistently and unconsciously in a state of engagement, merely by contrast. I could continue to get together with him each time we unite, recalling all the ways in which I adore this man. It'd be easy to keep falling for him, to keep remembering that after having met so many people throughout the world, he is by far the person that compliments me the most. I could keep doing this, keep that flame lit, in hopes by the end of the year he will have grown in ways that fill those unmet preferences in partnership, and we will be again well-matched. 
This keeps us bound to each other by love and does not give us the space as individuals to grow uninhibited and develop into the people we are to become. It also prohibits the possibility of others entering our lives that may be better suited for where we are along our journeys. And perhaps most importantly, it keeps me in a state of attachment to what was, because at the moment, it is not what is. I've processed letting go before. I've had to move on emotionally from lovers past, letting my mind make the choice my heart would soon follow. I never thought I'd have to do that with this person. That is why my heart has felt the depth of loyalty and commitment to him. I was ready, but I see that trying to hold on to anything at all is exactly what separates me from the whole. The whole of Emily Rose, the whole of the earth, the whole of the universe, and the whole of life. So to sum up what I've learned in the past 36 hours, one, I now get to begin to address and grow within myself the qualities I love about my ex. Two, by doing this, I will begin the process of not needing a love from outside of me to heal separation by fusing yourself with another person. And three, by becoming whole and single, I create the space for what is to be, which is, right now, my life in solitude and without romance. I now recognize it is time for me to let go. And while I am just now arriving at that decision and becoming mentally prepared to let go, I know this is only the first step. Releasing the grips of attachment takes time, and I'll be walking this path for the next months to come, for sure. Callie and I send love to all.